Next, I'd like to introduce Annie Potter. She is a nurse practitioner at Boston Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Hello, my name is Annie Potter. I am a nurse practitioner and an addiction clinical educator at Boston Medical Center. Today, I'll be discussing adolescence and opioid use disorder. I have no financial disclosures. However, Boston Medical Center's Office-Based Addiction Treatment Technical Training Assistance Program is grant funded by the Massachusetts Bureau of Substance Addiction Services. What do we know about adolescence? We know that it's a key developmental period for um, children. It's transitional age where they start to transition from being um, independent decision makers, where they have this decision making skill. They're also kind of getting out of that society driven day to day attending school and setting their own agenda. They're also finding um, their own identity, exploration, search for self. They're figuring out who they are, what they want out of life and who they want to be. And we see this increased autonomy, not just in decision making, but in future planning as well. However, we also see it as a time where adolescents take more risk taking in regards to finding out their identity exploration. We know that brain development continues into your mid 20s. And so the last part of the brain to develop is responsible for impulse control and planning judgment. And therefore, as a result, adolescents and young adults are more likely to take risks and fail to consider consequences. One thing that we know out of the landmark study from 2003 is that adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs, can contribute to the risk of someone developing a substance use disorder. ACEs include things such as abuse, either physical, emotional, sexual, physical and emotional neglect, household dysfunction, if there's mental health that's untreated in the household, an incarcerated relative, substance use, which is exposed to the youth at a young age, mother or any kind of partner treated violently in the home or divorce. What we see that each adverse childhood experience increased the likelihood of early substance initiation by two to four times. Young adults and adolescents can largely be influenced by families and their peers. Youth with low family bonding prior to age 15 were three times more likely to initiate early substance use. Having antisocial peers, particularly those over the age of 18, increased the likelihood of early substance initiation. And we know that interventions with youth and young adults should not only target the individual, but the peer group as well. What's interesting to note is the family bonding prior to age 15. This follows in line with the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations of sharing family meals together, which also showed a decrease in childhood obesity. And so we see that early family bonding is really protective for a lot of chronic conditions that start early on in age. So where are we now? How is this a harm reduction? Well, we see that teens, um, there's trends in teen overdose rates. And between 1999 and 2016, the death rate related to overdose amongst 15 to 19 year olds increased sharply. It was 95% increase for prescription opioids, 405% for heroin. And of course, with the ubiquitous nature of illicitly manufactured fentanyl, it was almost 3000% increased. What we're seeing now is that two out of three individuals in opioid treatment report first use before the age of 25, and one in three report first use before the age of 18. So early screening, initiation of treatment is a way of reducing harm for future consequences of substance use. What we see here is that all there's um, an increase in substance use among all youth. However, we see a sharp increase between those as ages 18 to 25. We see this increasing despite the 2002 FDA approval of buprenorphine for the outpatient treatment of substance use disorder. We also see from the same study from 2017 that only 31 percent of those that were diagnosed with a substance use disorder received medication six months following the diagnosis of an opioid use disorder. What we see that there was low percentage of offering any medication and any medication consists of methadone, buprenorphine, or naltrexone. We see low rates of methadone um, being offered for those uh, with substance use disorders. 
um, followed by buprenorphine and also naltrexone. Furthermore, in looking at health disparities, the study showed that Black youth were 42% less likely to receive medications, and Hispanic identifying youth were 17% less likely to receive medications. The um, rate of receiving medications were also lowered if you were female gender identifying and also younger in age. So we see that there's a lot of cultural, gender, and age biases that we need to overcome in order to decrease some of these health disparities in getting treatment to our high-risk youth. For those practicing in pediatrics, we all know that there's a craft screening that was developed um, at Boston Children's. And it's uh, the craft screening starts with C for car. Have you ever ridden in a car driven by someone, including yourself, who is high or have been using alcohol or substances? Now, if this is a yes, then that is an immediate safety concern that should prompt the involvement of a parent or caretaker for anyone, regardless um, uh, of age, but especially with those less than 18. Have you ever used alcohol or drugs to relax is the R? A is for alone. Do you ever use alcohol or drugs when you were by yourself? F for forget. Do you ever forget things you did while using alcohol or drugs? And F for family and friends. Do your family or friends ever tell you that you should cut down on your drinking or drug use? And lastly, T, trouble. Have you ever gotten into trouble while you were using alcohol or drugs? Now, why is this craft screening so important? Well, it had a really good probability of predicting if somebody met the DSM-5 criteria for substance use disorder based on the CRAFT score. So we see if we screen early that that can actually be an indicator later on of the probability of, of um, an individual being diagnosed with substance use disorder. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that pediatricians consider offering medications for opioid use disorders to all their adolescent and young adult patients with severe opioid use disorders or discuss referrals to providers for this service. The three FDA-approved medications that you know of, buprenorphine, naltrexone, and methadone, um, are approved for the treatment of substance use in adolescents. There is a um, age limit, however, for buprenorphine. It's approved for those ages 16 and older. It's often considered first line um, as the follow-ups can be done in an outpatient setting. So uh, youth can still attend school or the activities of daily living they need to do, interact with peers. It's also medication that can be picked up from a pharmacy. And as we know from some of the data, buprenorphine is also protective from fatal overdose. Naltrexone is also available in an outpatient setting. However, it's approved for patients ages 18 and older. And methadone is approved for patients ages 18 years and older. There are extenuating circumstances where someone less than age of 18 could be considered for a methadone treatment program. The biggest barrier, however, can be finding a methadone ma maintenance treatment program that takes um, individuals less than the age of 18. It also requires documentation from two separate treating physicians stating that the patient um, was unable to achieve remission with other forms of treatment. And as always, it's important to integrate into the psychological, uh, psychosocial treatment options, such as family interventions and behavioral interventions. This is an age where developing peer and relationships is integral. A lot of times when you enter into treatment, they lose some of that peer support group and really struggle to find peers that abstain from substances. So what's different about treating adolescents? Really taking into consideration this is a transitional age. They're looking for autonomy. They may also be struggling with housing after 18. Some youth may lose the family um, home that they were living in. Education as that school and that day-to-day -day um, structure may have been lost. They may be searching for employment, or employment may be very high on the list of priorities. And of course, health insurance um, by the age of 25, uh, 26, excuse me, as those are transitioning off of parent and guardian health insurances, that they may be struggling to navigate their way through the health system. The biggest challenge um, that I see when uh, treating adolescents is there's some ambivalence regarding treatment. Many may be encouraged to receive treatment by concerned family members, may be legally um, involved or pushed by social services. The motivation may not fully come from within. Also, as we know, the decision-making may fluctuate as does their motivation. And so they may more likely to seek treatment on demand. 
The other thing that I see is long term for someone who is um, adolescent or young adult is different from what adults consider long term. So when you bring up a lifelong medication to adolescent young adults, they often shy away of wanting to even start on medication treatment. For them, long term might be a couple months or even six months. So when I discuss medication options, we discuss goal driven to see how we can reach, reach those goals with patients, either with or without medications. My goal is for patients to stay engaged within the medical community to receive treatment for substance use disorders and meet them where they're at. Early in the trajectory of addiction and its harms, as um, youth may be more treatment responsive than adults. Often have never received medications for addiction treatment before, and so this is an opportunity as a provider to screen and refer them to treatment. And many may still be learning how to navigate the health system for themselves. They may miss appointments, arrive late, not know how a pharmacy works, um, carrying around an insurance card. And so these are all barriers that we have to help uh, patients meet. Confidentiality. So, in, so from the National District Attorneys Association in 2013, this is um, kind of the legal language of what is to be expected. However, we see that a minor 12 years of age or older who was found to be drug dependent by two or more physicians may give consent to the furnishing of hospital and medical care related to the diagnosis of such drug dependency. We see some stigmatizing language, but we can see what they're getting to, that if um, that they do not need the consent of a parent or legal guardian for treatment. Now, these laws can change from state to state. And so I would check with um, your local state agency if you don't practice in the state of in Massachusetts. Lastly, even when a minor does not want to include their parents in treatment, there are some key points you should make sure that they understand. One is medical or pharmacy bills may be sent to their parents or even the explanation of benefits. And if on a medication, it may be difficult to store safely without the patients being aware. And also, many may uh, find it challenging to make regular appointments, especially in areas where transportation may be limited. That is my email address, annie.potter at bmc.org. You can also find more information, trainings, and request technical assistance at www.bmc.org or uh, excuse me, www.bmcobat.org. Lastly, there are some key resources available to you. There's a toolkit for pediatric and primary care providers in treating opioid use amongst adolescents and young adults available from Mass Clearinghouse. Also at www.aap.org, there is resources to address the opioid epidemic, excuse me, in your pediatric clinics. Thank you. Here are some of the key points from Annie's lecture. Buprenorphine is licensed for the treatment of opioid use disorder for patients 16 years or older. Always screen and practice harm reduction for risky behaviors in adolescent patients. Though information is protected, make sure adolescent patients know what parents might see, including bills, frequent visits, or prescriptions.